Hello and welcome to the Haughty Culturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we post every Friday, so do hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing horticultural adventures. And don't forget, if you've got a question you'd like to ask me, pop it in the comments section below, and we will deal with it on Mondays when we do our 60 second short. So we, you, will do our best. Well, you'll ask the question, so you're doing your bit. But Stephen, where are we? And what is this very handsome shrub that's behind us? Well, it is in fact the topic of today. No. Uh, and we're at the Melton Botanic Gardens, yes. which is a remarkable collection of all sorts of plants from dry regions around the world, but mm. particularly Australia. Yeah. And the shrub behind us is one of those many shrubs we're going to talk about today, which is the Erymophila genus, mm. or commonly known as emu bushes. Now, I'm going to say something shocking. <gasps> Never heard of them. Well, there you go. It's one of the Australian genera that is probably a little less known to people both in Australia and overseas. And when we arrived here, I mean, just looking at this plant, it is so dramatic and beautiful and mm. gardeny. Yeah. Great foliage, great flowers. Why isn't it on the tip of everyone's tongue? Well, I think partially due to the fact that they require specific conditions. Mm -hmm. Many of them have a very weak root system and won't cope with wet weather. Right. So they have to be grafted and so forth to keep them going in heavier soils. Yeah. And so they're just a little bit more hard work to mm. prepare for sale so that the general population can engage with them. Mm. But having said all of that, we're here today for that very reason, to get the general public to suddenly take notice of the Erymophilus. Yes. So if you are in a drier climate, if you're in a Mediterranean area, then these are the shrubs for you. Well, exactly. Even their name tells you, desert loving Erymophila. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So we're going to look at a whole range of them from tiny little ground covers up to quite substantial bushes like that one and talk about their requirements and their conditions and just how beautiful they are. Well, let's go. All right, let's do it. Here we are wandering around the Erymophila collection at the Melton Botanic Gardens. Yes. And I have to say, I knew it was a fairly interesting group, but I wasn't expecting as much diversity as we've found. Well, I wasn't, I'd never even heard of them. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, well, you can't know everything, Matthew. <sighs> so, you know, that's what we're here for is to teach you. So exactly. anyhow, yeah, so we've come in to have a look at the different species and forms mm. in this garden mm. and to see what sort of garden merit some of them might well have for those who are gardening in a Mediterranean style of climate. And I think there is more than enough to be carrying on within this garden. Yes. So put the genus in context. Where are they all from? All right. Well, they're all Australian. Yeah. And there are some species that come from every mainland state. So the yes. only place in Australia you don't have them growing naturally is in fact Tasmania. Why is that? Uh, well, I think it's just too cool. Uh, damper climate and the Erymophilus just never found their way down there. Yes. But there's even a species that is local to this area mm. and Melton is a low rainfall area, mm. uh, less than 400 mils a year as a rule yeah. and as long as the beds are built up above their heavy clay soils, the Erymophilus do surprisingly well here. Mm. Well, as we're wondering, I'm seeing some incredible examples so we should just go through the collection one by one and look at the ones that leap out at us. Yes, exactly. I mean, we're only going to sort of touch superficially on the genus, I think, yeah. but nonetheless, it'll give people a good idea of what they can expect if they get engaged with emu bushes. Which they should. No, of course they should. All right, let's go and have a look. All right. Stephen, be still my beating <laughs> yeah. heart. Look at this. I have to say, Erymophila has a lot going for it as a genus. This has to be one of the prettiest forms of Erymophila glabra mm. that I've ever seen. I have to say the species, glabra, is so diverse yeah. that I think the taxonomists need to get to work because we'll see some other forms that look absolutely different to this yeah. that are still under the same species. Yeah. So, But this one, the contrast with the flowers and the silver foliage, yeah. Unbelievable and a great form. I mean, this is the most perfect garden plant. Well, you would have thought so. I mean, yeah. you've got something that's sort of a metre and a bit in each direction. Mm. It's obviously doing that quite naturally. And the contrast between the flowers and the foliage is dramatic. Yeah. And so it would look good in or out of flower. And so apparently this one comes from the Murchison River area. Right, so in Western Australia. In Western Australia, where my a lot own, of... <laughs> my old stomping ground, yes. the Murchison River. Um, and you can imagine this in a Mediterranean garden with aloes and cacti yeah. and all of those other uh, dry garden plants. Yes, exactly. And of course, it likes those sorts of conditions. Mm. So they need sharp drainage, not too cold, plenty of heat, uh, and then they just perform. 
It's stunning. Well, this is such an eye catcher. Well, should we go and look at some of its cousins? Yeah, or, or other forms of the same species, yes. which I'm sure the taxonomists need to visit. Okay. Let's All right. Now, Matthew, just for contrast, this is also supposedly a form of Erymophila glabra. Uh, Bellella gold is the cultivar name of it. And when you compare it to the silverleaf red flowered one we've just looked at, they're chalk and cheese. I can't believe that they're both considered to be part of the same species. But at this stage, at least, this is also an Erymophila glabra. So you've got these amazing yellowy green flowers, dark green foliage, and this really low mounding matting form, which would make it a very good ground cover in a garden, I'm sure. So that just gives you a sense of the diversity. Now, nah, Stephen, <laughs> this is such an eye catcher. My and, goodness. And so, again, uniquely different from all of the other Eremophilas that we've uh, engaged with. This one's commonly called red rod, although I think red is pushing it a bit. I would say pink, pink, pink rod, Eremophila calorabdus. It comes from the southwest of Western Australia. And unlike some of the ground covery ones, this one would be ideal if you've got a narrow bed along, say, a driveway, between windows on the front of the house, mm. uh, anywhere where you want that sort of vertical line look. And it flowers prolifically and I'm sure attracts lots and lots of pollinators. The other thing that strikes me with this particular one is it does look like an erica, like it's... a giant... Yeah. Erica, the flowers. It does. It's, it's got that sort of look about it. Of yeah. course, being in the Scrofulariaceae family, it's not at all related to uh, uh, Erica's or Epacris's. Uh, it's more closely related to snapdragons. Really? Yeah, that's the same family. Oh, actually, that this, I guess. Yeah. The, shape of the flower. Yeah, yeah. and, and foxgloves. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're in the same plant family. So there you go. So wow. this particular one, Red Rod, I think is. Well, it gives you a sense of the diversity. I think it's, you know, it's a really remarkably different looking Eremophila. I mean, we're seeing things that are tiny with tiny dense leaves yep. and tiny flowers. We're seeing things that are very silver, very sculptural, very arid looking. Mm -hmm. We're seeing things that are very dense green carpets that are ground covers, very vertical, spindly, South African looking plants. Yeah, it does. It should be in the fin box. Massive <laughs> shrubs that yeah. defy description, big jump. Yes, Big John, yes, yes, so there you go. So it is, it's a remarkable genus. It is, okay, well, let's look at more. All right. Now this stops us both in our tracks. <laughs> yes, nothing like a good silvery ground cover shrub. Oh. And subflacosa, as this Eremophila is known, yes. is another one of the Western Australians. Mm. Now it's actually in flower, although sporadically, I don't know whether it flowers more heavily than this, mm. but the flowers are small and greenish, so mm. the flowers are actually not that important. No. But the foliage... So and, and, you know, from a distance, I know this might sound silly, it did look a bit like one of those mad euphorbias. Yes, yes, I can see where you're coming from. I was thinking maybe cotton candy, like a Santolina or something like that from yes. a distance. But the most fabulous intense silver foliage with these much more subtle green flowers through it. Yeah. And it's next to a compatriot from the same part of the world that looks completely different. And this one looks like an Erica. It, it looks... does. Yeah, I and guess if got... you look at the flowers really closely, you can see they're not. Mm. But that is Erymophila densifolia, meaning f foliage that's very densely Dense packed. Dense foliage. Yes, exactly. With little mauve flowers and mm. it's very heather-like form. It, mm. it really is a great shrub. And the two of them together actually work quite well. Although I've got a sense subflacosa might want to swamp densifolia given half a chance. Yeah. But beautiful plants, and it does give you a sense of the diversity. And I have to say, even next to it, there's a Galesii, question mark. So it might, in fact, not be Galesii or one of the weird forms thereof, with its lovely mauve flowers and its sort of more grey-green foliage. So it does give you an interesting aspect of the different forms that you can get in this remarkable genus. And how to use them in the garden. I mean, all of these three would have immediate applications in in garden design. I mean, yep. the form of this one is incredible. And actually the lime green flower does contrast really beautifully with the silver foliage. Yeah, but but subtle but beautiful. Contrasting mm. it with the bronze tips of this one and the dark green and the purple, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah so they are. They're really remarkable plants. Great group. And I'm sure there's a couple more we need to have a look at as well. I think there are. <laughs> yes, let's go and see some others. This one is a really interesting shrub. I think it would make a great garden plant. This is Erymophila Abiotina subspecies ciliata, and everything is slightly sticky to the touch, which isn't necessarily a great thing. 
but the flowers are this really quite remarkable mauve with a very big sticky calyx behind. So what you're really looking at here, most of the flowers are finished now, and you've got these rather attractive pink calyxes which are carrying the show on for possibly weeks, if not months, after the actual flowers have dropped out. So I think another great little garden plant. Now this one caught my eye because it's right in front of the car. Now this shrub, Yes. does not look like anything we've seen before. The leaves are completely different. Well, they are. They're, they're strange, long, even vaguely curled leaves. Yeah. So texturally, the plant is quite different. And it's past its best now, but they've still got a few flowers on it. And they're quite large white trumpets mm. with tiny little purple freckles inside. And you have mentioned that the foxglove, digitalis, is in, in the, the same, same family. family. And you can see that in the flower. Yes, you can in this because the flower is big enough to yeah. almost look like a foxglove flower. Yeah. And this apparently is an Eremophila called Big Polly. Uh, and it's really a like hybrid Polly. one. And Big Nona flora is one of the parents of it. Uh, and of course, Big Nonias have flowers that look very like this. So I can get the connections. So yeah. it all makes sense. And so this would be a good one if you're trying to hide your neighbours from uh, next door because it's three four meters tall mm. probably is wide so this is a substantial bush and when it's in full flight I think would look amazing because these flowers are incredible yeah beautiful thing on to the next yes let's go well here we are and here are our Erymophila experts so we've got <laughs> David and Barb Hello and thank you for inviting us to have a look at the collection thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> now I guess what is the common name of all of these plants? These are commonly called emu bushes. And why is that? Well, the myth is <laughs> that the seed of these plants had to pass through the gut of an emu before they would germinate. Have you, have you tried that, Barb? <laughs> I have not tried to be a, an artificial <laughs> emu. No, I or, think that would be a good idea. Or found an emu that's willing to experiment. <laughs> yes. How did you come by these plants? Did you grow them by seed or did you propagate them yourselves in some other way? Well, uh, Eremophilas are notoriously easy to grow from cuttings. So ah, okay. we've grown them nearly all from cuttings. We do have a few grafted ones, which are more difficult. But, um... I was going to say the grafting though, um, commercially is quite useful because they graft generally onto Myoporum and it will cope with wetter soils, damper conditions. Uh -huh. And some of those more risky Eremophilas, I take it would be better if they were on a grafted understock. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some are very difficult to grow on their own roots in mm -hmm. a climate like this. Yeah. And which one is behind us? This is stunning. So this one we originally got as Eremophila McKinleyi. So this one is now known as Big John in the nursery trade. Big John. Yes. Oh, yeah. We'll all look out for Big John. It grows exceptionally large. And you can <laughs> it must be about almost at the upper level of what an Eremophila can grow to. Yes, there aren't many taller than, than this. What's your thing about them, David? What's your connection? Well, they thrive in the Melton climate and make a useful understory plant for eucalypts. Mm. They'll produce colour for long periods of time and there is a huge variety of them available. But there's got to be species that will do almost any job you want when you consider there's, I think, somewhere in excess of 270 recognised species in the genus. Mm. Then there's all the hybrids and selections as well, like Big John here. And so there, it's a pretty big group of plants, mm. which I think has been terribly underutilised. We're all familiar with eucalypts and we're all familiar with callistamins and malaleucas and grevilleas and things. But Eremophilas are not one of those groups of plants that are in everybody's perception. I've never heard of them. Well, there you go. Are you outraged? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not outraged if you come from a wetter climate. Yes. Yeah. They literally love it dry. Yeah. There you go. Well, great for all the dry gardeners out there. Is Does it have a, a short flowering period or quite a long one? Um, it peak now but it will have flowers on it for most of the year and they flower, tend to flower after rains. Right now you mentioned before that you grew them all from cuttings so just for our viewers when would you take cuttings and from what type of, of wood from new growth old growth or okay. what? So we take them from new growth not when they're flowering so yeah. after it's flowered. Can I pinch a little piece off? Yeah. Ah. yeah. yeah. So something along yes, that line, Bob? Exactly. There we go. Exactly. So is that a cutting, essentially? Yes. So that's, we call that a tip cutting. Yeah. 
and we do them in the warmer months of the year. They don't like striking when it's cold, so yeah. we, we do them from about September to to February here, and they strike very quickly. All right, if I was doing one, I'd be getting rid of all of the flower buds and spent flowers That's right. where possible. Here's, here's me doing a slight master car class. A lot of the foliage. Yes, and you take a lot of the foliage off, and then you'd clean below a node. Yes. And then that cutting would go into something like that. Yep. So that's all there is to it. Do you it. generally use any um, hormonal treatments we or anything? Do. We use um, a, a gel, mm -hmm. a hormone gel. So there you go. That's how you propagate an erymophila. Oh, fantastic. Cool. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bob. Yes. Thank you. Here we have another one which definitely lives up to its name. Uh, this is the Erymophila splendens. It's a nice, small, not compact, but reasonably well-formed shrub with furry leaves, which are really quite pretty. And these amazing sort of scarlety orange flowers uh, verging to yellow down in the throat. This would be an absolute honey eater bird attractant plant in anybody's garden and really showy and good sized flowers in this genus. This one is another one of the Western Australian Eremophilus, where of course the genus went mad and speciated all over the place. Western Australia has far more species than any of the other Australian states and the diversity amongst them is truly remarkable. Well, this one really caught my eye. This is Eremophila mulleriana, which is named after Baron Ferdinand von Mueller who was of course the first director of the Melbourne Botanic Gardens. And the combination of small silvery leaves and this amazing dark burgundy, almost penstemon-like flowers on it, really, really fascinated me. I believe it's not an easy one to grow and it's probably better if it's grafted so that it has a strong root system under it, but it really is quite a remarkable little shrub. And apparently about a meter, meter and a half tall, not overly densely uh, furnished with leaves, but a little bit of pruning might in fact uh, encourage it to be bushier. But I just think the flower colors are remarkable. Now, Stephen, why have we come <laughs> behind the bushes? <laughs> yeah. Well, not for anything nefarious, I promise. Uh, one of the interesting things with Eremophilus is that because of the weak root system of many species, they tend to graft them to make them into good garden plants. Mm. And one of the major things they use for grafting is a, a plant in a related genus called Myoporum. Mm. And Myoporum is quite a strong shrub. They're commonly known as boobiellas in Australia, but they have comparatively inconspicuous flowers, so they're not great garden worthy plants, I don't think, yeah. but they make very good root systems for Eremophilus. And we have one behind us. But hang on, why do they make good grafting stock? Because they have a strong root system and they cope with water. Right. So, which the Eremophilus won't. Right, so the bottom half is managing more temperate yes, weather conditions. Exactly. The top half is being Mediterranean self. Well, exactly. So that's the it's reason. It's a Gemini plant. Yeah, well it is. And in fact, this is, this is even more than just a Gemini plant. Yes. This is actually a Chimera. Yeah. Now, Eremophila, as I said, is a distinct genus and yep. Myoporum is another genus, but closely related. And when they graft them together, you get the best of both worlds as far as a garden plant is concerned. Mm. But every so often a yes. grafted plant yes. will have the cells of one plant, which is the understock, yes. uh, meld with the cells of the plant above. This is sounding all very Frankenstein. -y. It is very Frankenstein. -y. And you end up with what's known as a chimera. Chimera. Yes. Now, chimera was a Greek goddess who was part lion, part serpent, part goat. Uh, a mix. A mix. So hence chimera. So you've yep. got the cells of different plants within the one. Where are we going with this? Well, we're just going with this in, in one general direction. Some chimeras actually are quite obvious physically. The only major thing that the chimera has created here is that the strength of the myoporum has come into the plant. So the original species uh, is a smaller shrub, the chimera form of it, which has got the myoporum blood through it or yeah. cells through it, is a much stronger, <laughs> bigger plant. Yeah. And the weird thing about it is the original plants were grafted. These ones have been grown as cuttings off the original plant, mm. but the cells of the myoporum have moved through into this plant, mm. even though it's on its own roots. It's mm. not grafted onto a myoporum. Mm. And the proof is in here where you have a branch of straightforward myoporum growing on the stem of an Eremophila. So in fact, this shouldn't be called Eremophila. This should have a name that includes both myoporum and Eremophila. So it might be, might be a myrophila, 
or an eriporum. However, <laughs> yes. this is just, this is like freak show botany because this yeah. is not something anyone's going to pursue. Quite simply, a different species is growing out of a different one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit mind-blowing. It is. Uh, I might add, any of these branches that come up that have got straight myoporum in them probably should be removed for two reasons. One is it's not attractive. As you say, it's a plain thing, yeah. Oh, darling. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And secondly, of course, it's quite vigorous. Mm. So if you don't remove the pieces of myoporum out of this eriporum or myrophylla, then this could become the dominant plant. So it could in fact overshadow the original plant. This is just extraordinary. So somehow the cellular identity of the rootstock plant yes. has traveled into the body of the second plant yes. from which a cutting has been taken. So now there's no physical remnants of the rootstock. No, exactly. Yet. There is a shade of its DNA, which for some reason yep. has decided to ping out on the back here. Yeah, and apparently it does this semi-regularly, uh, as we've been told. Wow. And so really, this isn't, strictly speaking, an Eremophila, I guess, in a way. Well, there you go. Uh, Astounding. So Big John is uh, having strange children. <laughs> yes, exactly. Really weird. Well, it's no wonder that this particular Eremophila, which is called Nivea, meaning snow white, has become quite popular in Australia in the uh, horticultural industry. It's normally grafted onto a myoporum so that it has a strong root system under it. Just makes a little shrub up around about a metre or so tall, has this intensely silvery white foliage and these beautiful mauve bells on it gorgeous little plant and it's probably been one of the the most popular that you could buy around the nursery trade in Australia. Well Stephen I am ashamed to say I'd never heard of Harry Harry Mothla. <laughs> I'm struggling with my pronunciation. Yeah well there we go. What stunning plants. They are they're a wonderful group of Australian natives and I'm hoping our little video might give them a little bit of a Change presence. the world. Yeah that's right so, so some people will be out there looking for them hopefully. I mean I'm I am fascinated by the whole emu bush common name and this notion that they have to pass through the digestive tract of an emu. Yeah. I'd love to know if that is the case. I think it's a myth. But there is, you know, what's that coffee that everyone was paying a fortune for that passed through the digestive tract of a civet in Indonesia or something? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to drink that coffee anyway, so I don't think I need to know. No. It. Anyway, amazing, amazing plants. So many thanks to the team at Melton Botanic Gardens yes. for having us today. Yes, it's been fantastic fun. Yes. Many thanks to Barb and David for their time, who are... I guess some of the founders of the garden in terms of growing so many of the eucalypt species yeah. here from seed when the, the garden was just a paddock. Yes, exactly. All right, if you want to know what we're doing next week, don't forget to subscribe and press the alert button so that you'll be aware of what's happening from week to week. Yes, and if you've got a question for Stephen, do put it in the comments below. Say where you're from and you will attempt to answer it in 60 seconds. I'll do my very best. <laughs> Now, all the plants we've named today will be in the copy of the text below. So if you can't see it, just click read more and then we'll all ping up in front of you. And then you'll be as intelligent as Matthew. <laughs> well, I don't know. Everyone constantly reminds me of my bad spelling, but never mind. But from Big John, the... Eremophila. Eremophila. We look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Bye all.